All right, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to Thursday night seminar series. Um, well, this evening is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Wheat. Uh, Jeff is currently a research professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, but as you probably know, he's also in residency at Moss Landing. Uh, you'll find, me in, find him in 502 or in his very dark office uh, in the faculty wing at the moment. Uh, so Jeff uh, got uh, his bachelor's in mathematics from the University of New Hampshire, and he's got his master's and PhD in oceanography from UW. And then he went on to Hawaii where he did a postdoc fellow in the early 90s, and I guess he got tired of wearing flip-flops, t-shirts, and drinking Mai Tais, and then moved to Alaska, <laughs> where he's been since, uh, ever since, pretty much. Um, so in terms of his research interest, he's mainly interested in the processes that influences the cycling of elements within the oceans, and his focus, I believe, is on uh, fluid transport through uh, the oceanic crust, pretty much, and how you know, fluid interacts with the crust and impact the chemical composition of seawater, I would say. Um, and today he's going to tell us about blue mud, uh, which is a term I never heard about before. I heard about the blue carbon or blue economy, but blue mud is the first. Uh, so I looked it up, and apparently it's some type of marine deposits or marine sediment that's got uh, lots of organic matter as well as lots of iron sulfides. But I guess we'll learn more today. Perhaps I'm wrong, but anyway, take it away, Jeff. Thank All you. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, oh, oh thank you. I will say there's beer over there. And uh, as far as I know, um, one nice thing about being in Hawaii, you always have beer in the seminars. And it's really hard to fall asleep while you're drinking beer, unless you're you know, ready to pass out anyhow. So uh, there, are, there are beers over there to help along. All right, so I'm going to, um, my name is Jeff. Um, I work a lot with Claudia and Trevor here in the front row. Uh, what we uh, normally do is uh, use geochemical approaches to figure out fluid flow through the ocean crust. We deal with it to figure out where the water's flowing, how the water's flowing, uh, what water rock reactions are taking place, what depositional environments are occurring, and also what sort of microbial processes occur. Um, most of the work is funded through NSF and NASA. Uh, recently, we've been funded a lot through uh, CW, which is a science technology center funded by NSF. And the work I'm gonna talk about today is uh, mostly funded through uh, IODP. Uh, inter, uh, that's ocean, scientific ocean drilling. So today, I'm, oh, I'm already, yeah. So today, I'm gonna talk about these uh, four different things, three different things. Where do we find the blue mud? What's, uh, what happens in subduction? And what does the blue mud tell us? And then uh, some far out stories based on the blue mud and other things that we find in subduction. And then lastly, I'm gonna do a shameless plug for the Seafloor Science and ROV camp. It's a camp that Claudia, Trevor, and I do. And uh, we're always looking for instructors and it's a paid summer camp for third to fifth graders and sixth to ninth graders. All right, so how many people here work with mud? All right, so what's your favorite color mud? Anyone? Gray. Gray? Okay, where, where do you work? All right, so, so like there, there's all sorts of color mud. There's black mud, uh, if you go out here in the slough, smells, uh, it's usually because of the iron uh, sulfides, hydrogen sulfide. There's red muds, usually iron oxides. There's white muds, usually carbonate. There's green muds, if you have near hydrothermal systems, it's usually nontronite. Uh, there's yellow muds from sand. And of course, based on the title, there's also blue mud. So, and blue mud really is blue. Um, this is an ODP core. Uh, here's the surface. It starts off kind of gray and brown and works its way into white and dark blue. And here's another gravity core. You see the blue. Um, and uh, it, it, you can get all sorts of different shades of blue. And where do we find those blue muds? Well, we find the blue muds over here. Um, here's the Mariana Trench. Here's the arc uh, behind the trench. So Guam is down here. Saipan is one of those islands. And in between this island arc and the trench are serpentinite seamounts. These are mud volcanoes um, that are roughly, typically between 50 and 100 kilometers from the trench although there are some that are closer, and they're made of serpentine, which is this blue stuff over here. And uh, the blue stuff, um, like I said, it comes in all different shades. This is pretty dark. 
The darker blues typically have more sulfide in them. The lighter blues uh, typically have less sulfide in them. As you open the cores and let them sit in the room, uh, over time they turn green, which is a sort of your normal color, what you think of uh, serpentine minerals to be. There's serpentinite around here, especially in California, it's all green. But they start out blue, and I have no idea why they're blue. Um, I, I just don't. Um, but they are blue, and they, they, they turn to green with time. So, oh, so, so the reason why these serpentinite seamounts exist is because the Philippine plate is going, uh, projecting over to the east, while the Pacific plate over here is projecting over to the west. And um, as a result, in the crust, there's, uh, there's faults, a long strike and a cross strike that penetrate through the uh, Philippine plate all the way down to the subduction zone or the subduction channel. And then also you have seamounts coming in from the Pacific that also deform the overlying crust causing cracks. And these seamounts, these mud volcanoes um, along here that, are the, that provide the blue mud to the surface form where those cracks, where those faults come together, where two or more come together. And some of these things are quite big. They can, they're the biggest mud volcanoes on Earth. They can be 50 kilometers wide and a couple kilometers tall. This is South Chamorro Seamount. Um, you notice there's some lines drawn in here. Those are fault lines. So as these mountains build and build and build, every now and then there's a catastrophic collapse and material just slides away. In the case of um, South Chamorro, there's material that slides right down into the Mariana Trench. This is a Pac-Man Seamount. And this used, to be, this used to be one big nice seamount, but all this material in here is way over here to the right. And now it's rebuilding where this is the active part of the dome where the faults come together, where material is coming up from subduction from below. So how does all that work? Oh, one last, one last thing before we get into how it all works. So um, obviously these things are episodic. They build, um, they build to a point, then there's a collapse and there's some slides. Uh, this is all serpentinite mud. Um, yeah, sorry about that. This is all serpentinite mud. Um, you notice the different colors. It went from dark blue to green to yellow. Um, what this is is a transition. You can imagine you have a slide where you have a nice deposit. It sits at the seafloor for tens of thousands or maybe a million years before the next slide. And during that time, the upper part oxidizes, turns tan. The part below it is green that doesn't have as much oxidation, and then you get down to the blue, which still has some sulfide in it. And over time, as these things are open on the bench, everything turns green. Um, so you, you have to go out and sample it right away or if you're into a specific color or a specific trend. Um, on the flanks of these seamounts, the material gets pretty plastic. It just sits there, literally, uh, some of these seamounts are 50 million years old, and this material sits there and they continue to react with the water and the materials uh, that are in there. And this looks like a, a nice mess, but what this is is basically you're sucking in the sample and it's uh, sort of taking any structure out of, out of um, orientation and uh, pulling it in. This probably used to be nice little layers with uh, little pieces of rock. Um, here, for example, is a piece of rock that's coming up in the mud matrix. So in the mud matrix, there's rocks. The rocks come from the underlying Pacific plate, uh, basalt, sediment, um, as well as coral. And then also from the overall riding plate, um, from uh, some mantle material. So I'm going to show this a couple of times, this cross section. And essentially what's happening is as the Pacific plate subducts, you have increasing temperature and pressure. The overriding Philippine plate has uh, mantle rocks up here. And what happens is the water from uh, the subducting plate is getting squished by compaction. So that's pushing out some water, especially near the uh, trench axis. But it's also squishing out water from reaction with clays. And I'll get to that in a minute. This water then uh, goes up these faults, reacts with the mantle to form the serpentinite that then gets to the surface. So you have a sort of a conveyor belt. 
So most of the material just gets subducted. Some material comes down and then comes back up after reaction and forming these uh, blue mud volcanoes. So one of the interesting things about the fluids that are coming up, when you actually get these fluids and squeeze them and get the water out, the pore fluids, and analyze them, is that the chlorinates are less than seawater. So that means you're either taking out salt, you're, you're taking out chloride, or you're adding water. And although there is uh, the potential to take out chloride with uh, some chloride-bearing minerals, especially if there's no magnesium around, which there isn't, um, we've never seen any of those minerals. Um, so what's more likely is that we're adding water from water that was in clays originally. When you deposit clays on the seafloor, they're nice and hydrated. As you start heating them up and putting them under pressure, the inner layer waters come out of the uh, layers, and um, the end result is the pore fluids that come up have a chlorinity less than seawater. So at different temperatures, different reactions take place. So like the, um, so the first sort of reactions take place in the 50 degree range. Um, and uh, so we know because Blue Moon is one of these places where the chlorinity is less than seawater, um, and for some other tracers, that the temperature here as the plate gets subducted is at least 50 degrees. And as I go through this, there's other indicators that provide us with some information of what's happening as a function of depth. And I will also get into um, the, a little more about the decarbonization in a couple more slides. The bottom idea is, the, the main take home is, as these fluids subduct, some of the fluids come back up, and we can collect those fluids, analyze those fluids, and then be able to say something that's happening down here in the subduction channel. So this is important in the sense of understanding how a, a subduction zone, how the dynamics work. Is it one that uh, slides uh, nice and easy so that the earthquakes are gonna be minor? Or is it one that gets stuck, in which case the earthquakes are gonna be huge? So as this water comes up, excuse me, um, getting a little uh, happy there with the button. As this water comes up, um, some of it comes out at the seafloor. Uh, this is the borehole where we put an instrument on top and this white little fluff is the same as these white crystals, which is the same as these little fingerlings. It's brucite. Basically, the fluids that are coming out have a really high pH. And so the hydroxyl ion and the water that's coming out reacts with magnesium and seawater to form brucite. These little fingerlings are about um, an, a centimeter or two in diameter, um, and they're, they're quite fragile, but they're really cool looking. In contrast, this is a, cal a carbonate um, feature. This is probably five kilometers high, and it's active, and we uh, knocked it over to try to get water co that's coming through it. But the water that's seeping through comes through so slow, we were not able to actually collect any of the, the fluid that was coming through. And all around this big feature are other remnants of, it used to be taller and then it fell over and keeps building and, and so on and so forth. So um, a, a key aspect to these, this fluid flow and this water coming out is it's got a high pH and it either forms carbonate or even brucite type chimneys. So um, here's a slide of, this is I think the only slide I have of well, I got one other one so of chemical data. But here's pH, alkalinity, calcium as a function of depth. Um, the three different colors represent three different seamounts that are different distances from the trench. So the blue one is closer to the trench, about 50 kilometers from the trench, and it's cooler. The red one is about 85 kilometers from the trench, and it's warmer. So basically, as you're, and, and this um, asymptotic value that uh, is basically the composition of the fluid that's in the subduction channel below that's being upwelled through the seamount and being expressed on the seafloor. And what we can do is um, you'll notice right away, like the calcium is really high in the, in the cold fluids and it has a low alkalinity and a pH is of around of 11. Um, pH of Clorox is about 11. Um, and, and these are all natural fluids. In contrast, further away from the trench, 
where it's going to be deeper and more pressure at depth. You have uh, um, no calcium. The alkalinity is really high, and the pH is around 12 and a half. So that's uh, in the hydroxyl concentration, it's more than an order of magnitude more than uh, what you'd get in Clorox, um, for example. So from collecting pore waters, or from collecting the mud, the blue mud, squeezing out the pore waters, analyzing the pore waters, and looking at the profiles and the systematic variation in the chemical composition as a function of depth, we can figure out what the fluid is in the subduction channel below. And based on that, we can start saying what sort of reactions are taking place and um, uh, un under what conditions those reactions are taking place within the subduction channel. So getting back to this cross plot, one of the things that's happening that we know of, especially in Blue Moon, first of all, we have serpentine um, and serpentine night minerals. So we know we're, we're going to have some hydrogen production from, from the process of forming the serpentine. So um, for example, hydrogen is produced um, and will come out at Blue Moon. Um, however, at depth, um, we find at South Chamorro, there is no hydrogen. And there's lots of methane. And there's no methane over here at, at Blue Moon. And we know, based on these things, and given an idea of what the chemical composition of the fluids is that are coming up, we can say that the fluids that are coming around here are um, 80 to 100 degrees or 150, and the fluids that are coming out here are more like 250 and higher. We need the 250 degrees or higher to generate, to um, release carbon. The carbon that's locked up in veins as carbonates, as well as in the um, carbonate that's in the sediment. So over here in, in the deeper area where you have high temperatures, the hydrogen that's released from serpentization reacts with uh, the carbonate ion to form methane and jacks up the hydroxyl ion. And that's what gets you the high pH. Normal serpentization processes will only get you to about a pH of 11. Which, and that's what we see over here at Blue Moon. But we see the pH at South Chamorro at 12 and a half. And the only way to get there is by having consuming all the hydrogen to form methane, um, or at least most of the hydrogen to form methane along this process. And in doing so too, um, a lot of other reactions are taking place that back up our ideas that of what this temperature, temperature conveyor belt really is, from you know seawater temperatures down to uh, uh, three or 400 degrees Celsius at a depth of about 18 kilometers. And um, 85 kilometers from, from the trench. So this is the, uh, another plot of data, and then I will stop with the chemical data. But um, here's rubidium and cesium as a function of distance from the trench. And you can consider sort of the distance from the trench as a proxy for temperature. So as you move away from the trench, you get warmer and warmer and warmer and you see more rubidium and cesium. Um, this is the same plot except as a function of potassium. And the reason why we plot potassium is because um, distance really isn't always, uh, on, a, on a general scale, distance is a good proxy. However, on a, on a fine scale, it isn't because you have seamounts that are being subducted that are deforming the crust, and so you're getting um, slight changes as a, as a function of where you are on the plate being subducted. So potassium is better because the only way you get potassium is from the downgoing Pacific plate. You don't get it from the overriding mantle. So as a result, any potassium that comes out, you know it's because it's from the downgoing Pacific plate. And once again, you see sort of a trend of increasing rubidium and cesium concentrations as a function of uh, potassium. Um, likewise, the calcium, um, as, a, as a function of potassium, the calcium drops out, and um, it's high, sort of near the uh, trench, and then it's low away from the trench. Boron does the exact opposite. It's low near the trench and high away from the trench. And um, 
The sodium to chloride ratio just seems to increase with time, whereas lithium seems to spike at, uh, <coughs> at around um, a seawater potassium value. So what we can do with, with these types of data and these types of trends is we can then compare these data and trends to water rock experiments, where they use rock and where they've done sediment at various temperatures. You basically put rock and sediment in a little ball and a little bomb, heat it up to 300 degrees, and then take out water every now and then and see how it changes with time. Based on those um, and doing those tests at 150 and other temperatures, based on those experiments, we can then say, and also based on the actual uh, rock matrix that comes up, what minerals are being formed, we, we know that the fluids coming out of big uh, blue moon, for example, are roughly about 80 degrees Celsius. On a celestial, they're about 150, 250 on a big blue, and about 350 or so, 250 to 350 on a South Chamorro. And that's based on the chemistry of the fluids that are coming out and the rocks. We also know what depth um, the subduction channel is based on seismic data. So from these uh, different data sets, we now have a clear indication of what the temperature is as a function of depth so that people who are modeling how the physics of a subduction process occurs, temperature is one of the biggest parameters because temperature will affect the uh, strain and stress of the material that's being subducted um, and the physical prop other physical properties of that material. And it's all about the interaction of the two. So. All right, so we find the blue mud right now. The only place on Earth where we find the blue mud is in the Mariana Four Arc. Um, that's where subduction is occurring, uh, although subduction occurs in many other places. The, the one reason why it's, uh, the blue mud is forming there is that the Four Arc is cracked. Faults go all the way down to the subduction channel. Um, and we know from the blue mud, by uh, looking at the pore waters, we can take a look at the asymptotic concentration so we know what, what, what the composition of that fluid is coming up. And from that, we can deduce what's happening at depth, what sort of reactions are taking place, what the temperature is at depth, and then um, compare that to um, distance with the trench or with the potassium to see how that progression, how that plate interaction is occurring as a function of depth. So now we can use some of those things. So I'm going to go out to some far out stories um, that re are all related to all this that are um, quite interesting. When I was a grad student, the general thought was as two plates collide, if there's any seamounts, when that seamount collides, it just gets garbled up and destroyed as it goes and gets subducted. That's in part because most of the uh, subduction zones that people were looking at back in the time were ones that had accretionary prisms where you might have a lot of sediment on the subduction zone. The Mariana Four Arc is a non-accretionary one, which means you don't have a lot of sediment buildup, and you can see different things that you can't see elsewhere. So on leg uh, 366, um, we collected a rock in one of our cores from hole 1491, which is from Blue Moon, this seamount over here. This rock was a, a reef cobble. You could actually see the actual fossils in it and determine what the fossils were. Um, and they date back to the early Miocene. Um, so that meant that that material came from way down here in the subduction zone and came up here where we actually cored it at the top of the seamount. So thinking back a little further, this, this material formed about 550 kilometers to the east on a seamount or an atoll. And then it slowly made its way to the Mariana Trench. And when it, um, just like this Friar Guillot, it's making its way to the trench. And as it gets close to the trench, it starts to get deeper and cracked and bent down into the, um, underneath the uh, Philippine plate. And um, right over here is where they did a dive, and they saw this. And this is basically reef material from a seamount that's being subducted, and it's all intact. You can actually look at it and check out the fossils that um, once you get close enough to it and check out the fossils. So this material is going down intact. And um, essentially, this piece got subducted about a million and a half years later. It started making its way back up um, to the seafloor. 
and it only got minimally heated, probably only uh, 50 degrees Celsius because it probably wasn't all the way down into, uh, into the mantle, into the upper part of the uh, crust here that's being subducted. And it came out uh, virtually unscathed uh, through that nice little transit of more than 1.6 million years. So if we draw upon that, think about microbes. Microbes can make the track also from here, from the sediment and from the basaltic crust. They can easily make it down here. That's uh, 100, 1.6 million years, and then back up where they come out at the seafloor. Um, <clears throat> however, the, there are thermal limits to life. Um, people have grown uh, microbes to 122 degrees Celsius. Other people have suggested that 80 degrees Celsius is about the thermal limits of life in uh, sort of energy-starved environments. And others have suggested that there's, uh, life can persist to up to about 150 degrees Celsius based on anecdotal evidence. Um, but certainly, there's going to be no life down here at 250 or 350. So this is a, a cross-section of the seismic data from South Chamorro Seamount. Underneath the seamount is a pelagic sediment layer. So before this seamount even formed, you had normal pelagic sediment. This seamount formed about 50 million years ago. So these sediments are 50 million years old, upon which the seamount just grew and grew and grew, and then every now and then parts of it slide off, and it keeps growing, other parts slide off, and so on. So if you think of the conveyor belt here, the, the crust is going to get subducted. Any microbes is going to die on the way down. And as it's coming back up, if it comes up the central conduit, it's going to be abiotic. There's going to be no life in it whatsoever. However, <clears throat> there, are, there are fluids that are coming out that do show sulfate reduction, which means those fluids had to have interacted with the um, pelagic sediments on their way up, which is basically acting as an inoculum for the microbes, and then up and out at the seafloor. And it's uh, really interesting that they're living in a pH of 12 and a half. And I mean, everyone uses Clorox to what? Kill microbes, right? You know, clean your house, whatever. And, and these microbes found a way to make a living at a pH of 12 and a half. All right, so <clears throat> another thing that's uh, interesting, that's uh, an ongoing debate, is uh, how life formed on Earth. Um, and one of the thoughts is, well, maybe life formed in one of these serpentinite seamounts. So, the fluids that are coming up have all the building. They have got simple organic molecules like acetate and formate. They have hydrogen and methane that microbes like. Hydrogen is a great source. They also have iron and nickel that's uh, used in many proteins for catalysts. <coughs> and um, some of the requirements for uh, initiating life, you need a mineral surface to act as a proto-cell. Uh, um, and we've got plenty of mineral surfaces here. Uh, you need a redox potential. So we've got hydrogen coming out. We've got the rocks. We've got the water. So there's plenty of redox potential for uh, a microbe to make a living. Um, and there's disequilibrium. There's fluid flow. The nice thing about fluid flow is it's bringing in new material all the time. It's taking away other materials all the time. Also, there's a new study that shows that you can use um, um, uh, fluid flow interacting with, uh, with clay particles, the mechanical energy of moving the particles is enough that you can transfer that energy into chemical energy, and uh, there's another potential source of energy for life to begin. A key aspect, though, is you need organics. We, we've got simple organics, and there's probably a whole host of other organics that we haven't analyzed. But critical to all of this is you have to be able to find a way to concentrate the organics. So the leading hypothesis for how life started on Earth is it was a hydrothermal system where fluids come up, it's on the, uh, on the Earth's surface, it dries out with time, and that pre-concentrates it. You add another infusion of hydrothermal fluids, another uh, episode of drying out, and so on and so forth to uh, concentrate um, enough organics and phosphate to actually make uh, reactions possible for, for starting of life. Um, so concentrating of organics, 
It is possible to do that in a uh, fluid flow system because you're always bringing in new stuff. And as long as you have uh, different charged molecules based on, let's say, mineralogy, there's a mechanism potentially for concentrating um, charged organics or charged um, products to being coming up through the, uh, through the conduit. And you also have longevity. You have a long period of time where the environment's stable. So this one is uh, 50 million years old, and even on the flanks, there's continued serpentization going on because there's parts of mantle rock that keep seeping up. Oh, geez. And, oh, yeah, wait, 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 here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go, that one. <clears throat> yeah, because um, there's still plenty of uh, material coming up. Got to hit the right one. There we go. There's still plenty of material coming up from below. Um, and then also getting on the sides here. I mean, there's huge boulders coming up through that conduit um, that are 10 or 20 meters long. Um, and they're, they're too heavy. They're more dense than the surrounding matrix. So um, these things are probably sporadic in, in nature, as well as there's also a constant sort of dribble of fluids and mud, muds most of the time. All right, hey, I got that one done. Since a lot of your uh, uh, seminars um, deal with global climate change, for this uh, quarter I thought I'd slow, throw in a slide. So South Chamorro Seamount, um, one of these seamounts holds about one megaton of carbon just in the pore fluids. Um, and considering, um, however, that's kind of, may seem large. It may seem large. It's, uh, it's really not. Um, when you consider how much carbon gets subducted every year. So there's uh, um, 13, well, it's probably more on the low end, more like 15 megatons of carbon a year gets subducted. And so even if you have one megaton in a 15, 50 million year old um, seamount, that's not much. Even, even though there is continual discharge um, through the top as well as continual building and uh, slumping off of material. So while these features are not important in today's carbon budget, you can imagine uh, in, in early Earth history, if there were a lot of such features because the, uh, the faulting in the overriding plate, um, such features could be an important way to, as opposed to having the carbon be subducted and be in the arc, coming back up in the arc uh, volcanoes, actually short-circuiting that and coming up in the four arc. But today, these things are not important to global climate change by any stretch. So this one, this one is a stretch. So um, these are high temperature or low temperature hydrothermal vents on a mid-ocean ridge. Um, these are called snowblower vents. And these occur because you have hot water um, coming up from hydrothermal systems. They're mixing with cold seawater as it's coming in. And that mixture um, in the order of uh, 15 to 80 degrees Celsius, the microbes really love that. They live on the side of the rocks. They're inside. They're, they're enjoying life. Every now and then, there's extra water coming out, forming these plumes. They settle out and deposit on the seafloor. Then pelagic sediments deposit on top of them. And as they move away from as the plate keeps moving away from the spreading center and the crust gets older and older, there's more and more sediment that gets built up and built up. As that sediment builds up, the temperature near the sediment basement interface increases. And what was, you know, um, at two degrees right next to it, now it's starting to warm up to five, now it's up to 10 degrees, 20 degrees. Now these uh, microbes are back in their happy zone. And the, you know, the 10, 15, 25, up to 80 degree um, temperatures. We know based on some deep sea sediments that the turnover times of these microbes is thousands of years. Um, and that's in an or, a relatively, um, or relative to the basement, sediments are organic rich compared to what's in the basement. So if there's turnover times of thousands of years in the sediment, um, at the sediment basement interface and in the basement itself, turnover times are probably much longer, potentially millions of years. Microbes also form spores um, as a way of uh, um, keeping their life cycle going. 
So it's entirely possible that the life cycle of a particular uh, bacteria species comes out, it's living in one of these nice um, uh, low temperature hydrothermal systems at the ridge axis, gets deposited on the seafloor, makes its way over to the subduction zone, gets subducted, and then comes back up and is found here, you know, in the serpentinite seamount on the seafloor. So now we have a whole life cycle potentially. Um, I know like for life cycles for humans, maybe uh, 100 years. Well, here we have a life cycle for a microbe that could actually be um, millions of years going through the whole process of beginning to end. So that's a little more far-fetched, but, um, but entirely doable. So um, getting near the end here, um, these are some pictures of a uh, uh, reentry cone and a uh, ROV landing platform. Here's a drill pipe from the drill ship. And um, what I wanted to let you guys know is uh, we've been funded to go back out to three of the, bore, uh, three of the sea mounts. Uh, we drilled and left uh, boreholes in the sea mount with the idea being that we're going to go back and um, put in uh, what they call a cork light. Basically, it's a pipe that allows us to sample the fluids that are coming out. And the, the main reason why we're interested in this is we really want to get a good dissolved gas data. The dissolved gas data tells us a lot about what's happening at basement um, in the subduction channel as that subduction process occurs. And we also want to get large volumes of samples, um, large volume samples for organics to figure out what's being formed abiotically um, as a function of um, temperature and pressure and all the reactions that are taking place. What other organics other than the, the acetate and the formate and the methane are being produced? So hopefully that'll happen in March of 2021. And also as part of that, um, we will be uh, putting flow meters on top of the uh, boreholes to measure flow rate as well as um, pressure so we can understand what the uh, permeability of the structure is in the conduits. And uh, uh, we'll be working with our Japanese colleagues who are doing most of the microbiology and German colleagues who are very interested in how these mud volcanoes form. What's the tilt? Um, how do they form over time? And um, uh, what's the episode, how episodic are these um, in uh, producing muds at the seafloor? So that would be another year and a half. So lastly, um, uh, in 2014, we started a summer day camp. Uh, it runs a week-long camps. We have them in Monterey, Cabrillo College, uh, Gilroy, and um, South San Jose. Uh, we have it for kids coming into third to fifth grade and sixth to ninth grade. It's a week-long camp, four hands-on activities per day. Uh, it's all centered around the seafloor and the technology that makes studying the seafloor possible. Um, and so we're always looking for uh, people that are interested to be instructors as well as help with the camps and their paid positions. Um, so I don't believe in um, non-paying. So if you're at all interested, come talk to Claudia, Trevor, or I, and we'll be uh, glad to hear from you and talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah. So with that, if you um, have any questions about the blue mud or uh, or about the summer camp, um, I'm all open for questions. Actually, you just mentioned at the very end of your presentation about uh, uh, gaining the uh, open the um, certain one kings to collapse. Is that what you said? Yeah. And I was wondering whether you had any sense, I mean, especially because you, you know, you're able to, um, to find alternations with actually normal biological antibiotic segmentation. Have you tried to date the segments in between the other side? Yeah, so these plasmic. Yeah, I mean, these we can date. Right, right. So yeah. Side where you have 
Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, there are places where uh, flow has occurred and there's been a long period of time where, let's say, um, pelagic sediment is built up and then there's another flow on top of it. Yes, um, they have been able to date some of those flows. And that gives an idea of sort of the minimum amount of time uh, from one flow to another. Um, yeah, hundreds of thousands of years in, in, in some of those places. But that doesn't mean that it's been 100,000 years. It could have been, the upper part could have been wiped out and then continue. Yes, yes. And my, my, my next question is whether, I mean, how much of the surface that actually gets into the subduction zone and whether it changes the characteristics of the subduction itself, it lubricates, so to speak? Um, very little of it makes it into the subduction zone. Um, most of it is uh, on the Philippine plate. South Chamorro is different because it's kind of close to the southern end where uh, the, the Philippine plate turns and, and is curved, and uh, the mud flows uh, have made it that far. Um, there are 17 mud volcanoes. Uh, basically, you can actually go and touch mantle rock um, along the trench in places. Um, so, it, um, yeah, very little of it actually makes it down into the trench and gets subducted. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, you can touch a, a coral reef and then go a little further down, touch a mantle rock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that experiment where you can like take a rock, put it in something, and then put it in the bomb thing and, and figure out the chemical process is happening there. How long, or I guess how do those experiments work? Because I know like chemistry happens really fast, but geology seems to happen on a long time scale. So are those like quick experiments that you do, or are those really like long term, have to wait not 10,000 years for results, but a while? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so right now we're doing an experiment at uh, 2 degrees and 25 and 60 degrees, and uh, we're planning on running it for five years. Um, and we've done it for a year, and there's very little change. Um, but once you get up to 150 degrees, 250, 300, you see changes quite, um, you'll see it in a couple of months. Um, so people tend to do experiments at higher temperature because they occur quickly. You see changes, and uh, you can actually do it in a, you know, a dissertation, as opposed to uh, um, the low end of the spectrum. Sorry, one follow-up question: um, Are they <coughs> under like normal pressure that they would be experiencing in the trench, or do you modify the pressure to make the process happen faster, or slower? Um, they're all different. Sometimes they're literally in a gold uh, sort of bomb, if you will. So whatever temperature is, it's contained, it's whatever that pressure is. In other cases, people have done it at pressure. Um, so it just depends on the experimental setup. And uh, temperature is the primary driver compared to pressure well, for most reactions. For the carbonate, the pressure seems to be huge. Yeah? Just to go back to your piece of coral study, because I'm not quite sure I follow the entire thing, because my my view of sub subduction is fairly rudimentary. Like you have, you know, a plate and another one that goes underneath, and then when if you look here, it disappears pretty much. So I guess what you're saying is that it's, that's not quite true. Like there is not much destruction going on, but all the stuff that's being subducted actually reappears right away on the non-subducting plates. Yeah. So um, so as it gets subducted, certainly um, this is uh, this is a seamount that's being subducted over here. And so that's, that's pretty much intact. And then by the time you get over um, about 50 kilometers from the trench uh, and you're down 12 or so kilometers or, or less because it's probably on a seamount, um, some of this material gets broken up and some of the material comes up. Not all of it comes up. A lot of it still gets subducted. But the whole idea is that that little piece looks like it did when it went down. Um, and you could tell what fossils were still there. They, they still weren't overprinted um, in the process, considering there's all that hydrogen around um, and other things that are 
quite reactive or potentially reactive. And the other question I had was about the far fetch microbial ID I have. Uh, so, so what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that those microbes, if they come up, then they would like, you know, snow down into a sediment, and then, then they would some, somehow hibernate for millions of years, and then get subducted and come back up and become alive again? Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Or? Yes. Wow, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't have to hibernate for too long because they only have to sort of exist for a couple, uh, 10 million years or so until it starts warming up. And, uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, um, one, one of the things that's uh, probably it'll come out in another 10 years is some of the slow growth. Um, they, fir they just, um, Kentakai and his group in Japan uh, just cultured their first archaea, um, which is, I, apparently, from a microbiology standpoint, really tough to do. And it's taken them 10 years to culture it, to uh, get it to grow enough, to weed down everything else. Um, and that's giving it everything it needs. Um, there are some microbes that are literally um, over here on the seafloor that um, their whole energy budget is based on radioactive decay, of natural radioactive decay, which um, isn't much you know, like from a normal rock, basalt. Um, and yet they are able to survive. And it's um, one of the things, uh, there's some guys that with the CW program, uh, they're starting to work with uh, the medical profession because when you, literally if you take a DNA and put it on the shelf, in a year half of your DNA is gonna be degraded. Yet these microbes can easily live for thousands of years without their, without their DNA being degraded. And uh, how's that happening? I don't know. But if you could figure that out, imagine how long humans could live. You know? <laughs> All right, well, there's more beer. All right. <laughs> All right.